Hi, I'm Beth Moorfield, an editor at Nature's Structural and Molecular Biology, and I'm speaking with Dr. Ian Hickson from the University of Copenhagen, whose group works on a mammalian translocase called PITCH, which is required to separate sister chromatids at mitotic anaphase. And at the symposium, he's going to be talking about the physical and functional properties of PITCH that make, make it uniquely suited to this purpose. And I just thought by way of introduction, we could talk about what DNA structures PITCH targets. Yeah, so PITCH uh, recognizes uh, an unusual structure in mitosis called an ultrafine anaphase bridge. So uh, when the separating sister masses of DNA come apart, they sometimes leave behind uh, a, a thread of DNA which has no histones on it. It also has, uh, it doesn't stain with DNA dyes. And the only way you can see it is by proteins that are bound to the structure. And so that's why we call them ultra-fine bridges, because you can't see them without staining for the proteins. And the first protein that was identified that recognizes these structures is pitch. And so it, to some extent, defines the structure. And it's not the only protein that localizes No, it isn't, no. There's a lot of proteins. They're mainly DNA repair proteins, actually. So the, the main complex that binds is called the Bloom syndrome complex, named after a protein that's defective in a cancer predisposition disorder called Bloom syndrome. So that's the BLM protein. And it has two uh, partner proteins. One is a topo isomerase called topo isomerase 3. And the other is a protein called RIF1. Mm -hmm. RIF1, and they bind to these ultrafine bridges. However, the binding of BLM and TOPO3 and RIF1 to these bridges is entirely dependent upon pitch. So pitch controls the recruitment of all the other factors to the bridge DNA. So it's not act actually actively disentangling the DNA? We don't think so. We think actually the TOPO isomerase 3 is the key enzyme for disentangling the DNA. So TOPO isomerases are enzymes that can uh, unknot and, uh, and disentangle uh, catenated or entangled DNA. So what are the physical well, properties or what is the nature of the DNA that Pitch recognizes? Uh, we can only speculate about that. Uh, we think the DNA is conventional double-stranded DNA but at its center is uh, entangled or catenated DNA such that the DNA cannot come apart. And what you have to do is you have to disentangle that to allow the DNA masses to come apart. So um, we don't think it recognizes the entanglement it, because it, it lines up, it sort of decorates the bridge all the way along its length. So the question is, how could it possibly do that? How does it know wh where to be on the bridge? And we think there's a reason for that, and we, uh, I just need to digress slightly. We collaborate with a group in the Netherlands, uh, headed by Heis Wouter, and they use a technique called optical tweezers, which is a method by which you can manipulate DNA molecules in a optical flow cell, <coughs> and you can apply force to the DNA. And so what they showed was that if you stretch DNA, that pitch binds to it much more efficiently than if you don't stretch the DNA. And in mitosis, the DNA masses are being pulled apart and the bridge is in between, and we believe the bridge is under tension. The, the bridge is being stretched, and so pitch actually recognizes the physical stretching of the DNA. So we see it as a form of tension, let's call it a tension sensor. Uh -huh. That's a little exaggerated, but I mean, that's how we sort of see it. That pitch has the fundamental ability to find a piece of stretch DNA in mitosis, and only in mitosis. It's an enzyme that's actually in the cytoplasm in interphase. So it only gets access to the DNA when the nuclear envelope breaks down in mitosis. So it's a purely mitotic factor that's sitting outside the nucleus waiting to rush in onto the DNA. Okay, so by actually using these stretched molecules, then you can mimic the cellular... Yeah, type. and we're doing that now. So we, we replace the sister masses of DNA with polystyrene beads, mm -hmm. and then we stretch a piece of DNA in between them. And so what is actually, once, once, so once pitch is actually <coughs> bound to the DNA, what is it actually doing to it? 
It's a DNA translocase, which means that it runs along the duplex of DNA without separating the two strands. So it's not a DNA helicase, which separates the two strands. It runs along the DNA, which can change the structure of the DNA. Uh, but its main job, we think, is to recruit all the other factors, including the Bloom's complex, that then do the real business. So without protein-protein interactions, they don't get recruited. And we've reproduced that now using these optical tweezer setups where we've asked uh, how does the Bloom protein recognize the DNA and how does Topo3 recognize the DNA and RIF1. And the thing is they sit on a piece of DNA that they cannot recognize themselves. So if you give them double-stranded DNA in vitro, they cannot bind to that. Pitch binds to double-stranded DNA, they bind to single-stranded DNA. But actually, if you coat the DNA with pitch, they now bind to the pitch-coated DNA. So pitch uh, allows the complex to bind to a piece of DNA it would never bind to mm -hmm. normally. And we don't think it manipulates the DNA structure because if you make a catalytically dead pitch, it still recruits the factors to these bridges. So it's the physical presence of pitch that then attracts all the other proteins onto there and then they find the abnormality and the, the entanglement, and then they disentangle it. That's our working model. Okay, so it's not actually activating those, those factors, but rather it's working as an adapter to actually recruit them to the sites where they're, necess where they're necessary. We think so, though it is an enzyme, and so it must be doing something to the DNA, and we haven't actually worked out what that something is. Um, it is possible, and, it, and we do have some evidence for it, that it actually changes DNA supercoiling. Mm -hmm. So it has, has the ability to actually alter DNA supercoiling in combination with the topo isomerase. So it's fairly preliminary at this stage, but we think it might be manipulating the DNA structure through tracking along the, the helix and actually imposing a supercoiling on the DNA. Now, we don't understand why that would help the situation, but a speculation will be that if the DNA is instead of being sort of relaxed, it's supercoiled, it actually drives decatenation more efficiently. That's been shown for other topo isomerases. Is this demonstrate, can you demonstrate this also by using decatenation assays? Uh, we are doing that, and it does seem to be helping decatenation, but it's very preliminary. I'm not going to talk about that in fact. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, and they don't, and these, and the, these individual factors, are, at least, uh, are they actually forming a uh, complex? The, the protein, protein they interactions yeah. off the DNA, can they do this at all? Um, yes, they can. We've, we've demonstrated that they form protein interactions, mm -hmm. pitch bind directly to both BLM and to topo isomerase 3. Um, and it does so through conserved domains. So we, 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 we're fairly confident it has the ability to recognize uh, the two proteins in solution, uh, but they never see each other outside of mitosis because pitch is in the cytoplasm and the others are in the nucleus. Okay, so one can actually recruit independently. So actually, I should ask you more about how pitch is distributed on the ultrafine bridges. Are there specific sites of recruitment or do you know how it's actually spreading? Does it think it's yeah, coating the whole bridge, but yeah, you know how it, it, it seems that? as if it gets recruited almost instantaneously to the entire length of the bridge. As soon as the bridge forms, you can see pitch along the length and however long the bridge gets, it, it just coats the entire thing. So it, it's not as if it nucleates in a little place. Uh, we are trying to test that in, in vitro with these optical tweezers, but it doesn't seem like it nucleates and grows. It seems like when the tension reaches a point that's suitable, it then just coats the DNA very quickly. Now, whether it's, you know, one possibility is it forms a filament on the DNA, mm -hmm. and so you end up with a cooperative loading of a large amount of protein in a very short period of time, forming some kind of ultrastructure on the DNA. But that, <coughs> that will require us to do some more detailed structural analysis. But, um, so in that regard, how does it compare with other DNA binding proteins involved in recombin or DNA recombination? Um, completely differently. They generally recognize, uh, you know, in, in almost like equimolar amounts, a particular type of, sub of substrate, whereas there may be, there'll be tens of thousands of molecules of pitch on a long ultrafine bridge. And the question is, why do you need tens of thousands? And you probably don't, 
but for some reason it may be that that's the only way that you can recognize the DNA quickly in anaphase, which of course happens very, very rapidly. You have to find the DNA, you have to decatenate it. The only way to do that is to basically cover the DNA and then get, get the bloom protein covering the DNA as well. And then wherever the problem is, you can deal with it. It can't be done by some slow tracking process because anaphase will be finished by then, it'd be disastrous for the cell. So we see it as a mechanism by which you waste a lot of protein on the DNA in order to essentially get, get to the place you need to be as fast as you possibly can. Now that may be naive, but that's kind of how I see it. And it doesn't have to contend then with nucleosomes, it would have to displace them. There's no. There was a hypothesis put forward in a paper that pitch actively removed the nucleosomes, but we're absolutely convinced that isn't the case because the catalytically dead protein recognizes naked DNA with no nucleosomes on, so it cannot have removed the nucleosomes from that. Um, so the DNA has no nucleosomes on it, and that's probably simply because it's stretched again. And if you pull on nucleosomal DNA, the nucleosomes pop off the DNA simply because of pulling, because essentially the DNA is wrapped, and if you pull, it just goes ping and falls off. Right, yeah. Except for pitch, right? So actually, so what other aspects of the, <coughs> what are the properties of DNA have you been able to elucidate using the optical tweezer approach? Well, you can, you can measure a whole series of parameters to do with DNA, uh, DNA structure, but it's not something that we've pursued in detail. That's a, a major interest of the lab we collaborate with. But we don't really analyze um, issues to do with how much you can stretch the DNA, what happens to it. But for example, uh, perhaps counterintuitively, if you stretch a piece of DNA too much, it actually starts to denature. It actually, the, the strands come apart. So you can actually make bubbles in the DNA by pulling very hard on it. And of course, if there are any nicks in the DNA, then the DNA strand will unravel and, and the DNA will become single-stranded. So eventually you can, you can basically denature a piece of double-stranded DNA by pulling hard on it mm -hmm. and it will just eventually, one strand will unravel from the other, which kind of is what you'd imagine. It, it certainly isn't in my head anyway, but that's, that's the observation that happens with extreme forces. One of the problems that we have is that we don't really know how strong the spindle forces are in a cell. They've been estimated, but the estimates uh, vary enormously. And so we don't know whether we're in the right ballpark with the optical tweezers. They are limited by how hard you can pull on a piece of DNA. Mm -hmm. So above about 50 piconewtons or something like that, it's really difficult to do anything. And you can go down to about five piconewtons in the setup. And it, that's the range that we have. And if the mitotic spindle isn't in that range, then we're, you know, we're not necessarily studying the right phenomenon. But uh, how one would test accurately the strength of the mitotic spindle forces, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, as I say, there have been estimates that vary by a hundredfold or something as to how strong it is. I should also ask just about how pitch is regulated. Uh, pitch is regulated very strongly by a kinase called PLK1, polo-like kinase, and its name is polo-like <laughs> kinase interacting checkpoint helicase. So it's phosphorylated by polokinase, and polokinase is required for its correct localization. Mm -hmm. It also localizes to the centromeres uh, before anaphase. Uh, but actually, pitch seems to regulate the localization of polo-like kinase as well, which is curious given how important polo is for, for mitosis, actually you can inactivate in a human cell pitch and the cells are still alive. But polo-like kinase seems not to regulate properly and not localize quite properly, which is remarkable that the cells are still alive. But that seems to be the key player in its regulation is PLK1. Yeah. So, and um, again, its regulation isn't changed or it's not subject to additional regulation by association with any of the other factors that it works with mm. on the on the ultra fine um, pieces. Not that we're aware of. Mm. I mean, um, the other factors on the bridge tend to be enzymes. Mm -hmm. They tend not to be modifying proteins. The only one that's a candidate for doing something interesting would be this protein called RIF1. Mm -hmm. 
because RIF1 is a targeting subunit for protein phosphatase 1. Yeah. So actually, RIF1 might be part of the mechanism by which dephosphorylation events occur mm -hmm. during mitosis around the bridge, and we're studying that in some detail now. Will you be speaking about this as well? No, we won't Not be speaking about RIF1, no. no. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's too preliminary, but we, we, it, that's the only candidate, really, as a regulator. Uh, but we've no evidence it regulates pitch itself, but pitch does recruit it to ultrafine bridges. So. Okay, well, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Will we be under time?